The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ayan Oshkosh. Cheryl Hentz here along with uh, Dan Rylance. Um, Dan's been a guest co-host up to this point, but um, I will say this, that uh, with uh, Tony Palmieri's uh, uh, election win the other night, uh, they will be sharing uh, permanent co-host duties. So um, welcome from that basis. I, I have half tenure. <laughs> there you Thank go. You. <laughs> and we're also very pleased to be joined tonight by uh, by two people who I think most citizens in the city probably know, Kathleen Propp to my left and Margie Davey to her left. Uh, they are both members of Breathe Free Oshkosh. And uh, they're, they're here tonight because of something that has come up recently at the uh, city council meeting. Um, this, this goes all the way back to... Uh, let's see, three years ago this month, as a matter of fact, when the smoking ban was first voted into place by the voters, mm -hmm. then there was some litigation. It was tied up for about a year, I think, in, in the courts mm -hmm. where it couldn't be put into effect. Then it was put in, into effect. Um, but then there were three or four restaurants, um, I believe, that were kind of holding themselves out to be private clubs, and they were allowing smoking. Um, they got citations, they stopped doing that, but one, the Hilton Garden Inn, uh, mounted a fight. They continued to maintain that its Lindbergh Lounge was a private club. Litigation moved forward. It was brought to the attention of the city council, city manager, and uh, I believe even the city attorney at the last council meeting uh, toward the end of March, uh, that in January, an out-of-court settlement was apparently reached but nobody was apparently told anything about it, and you two ladies brought it to everyone's attention um, at the end of March at that council meeting. Is that pretty much it in a nutshell? Definitely the general outline, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what is your main argument or complaint about the issue that you brought to the council? Let's start there. Well, the outcome of the court decision was that the Hilton Garden Inn has been issued a tavern exemption right. and to me that is unconscionable that is direct contradiction to the ordinance it is uh, all these strong words perversion <laughs> of the ordinance it's just and wrong yeah <laughs> we all know that the Hilton Garden Inn is not a tavern mm -hmm. and that I don't think was in a, personally, I'm not an attorney, of mm -hmm. course, I don't think that was an appropriate way to settle that lawsuit mm -hmm. by calling the Hilton Garden Inn a tavern because now they will be able to smoke in effect whenever they want to smoke. And there are certain rules about, in the court stipulation, about s posting extra signs so that the public is not allowed mm -hmm. in to these private functions, whatever they are, and it's... I have a hard time with it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not the hotel in its entirety. It's just their lounge. Is that correct? Or can you smoke anywhere on that property? My understanding is that it's the Lindbergh Lounge and all of the banquet facilities that okay. surround it. I, it doesn't affect the hotel rooms or anything okay. like that, uh -huh. of course. But okay. our okay. ordinance doesn't affect them. So, In their application, um, for this exemption, and I had it here somewhere. Of course, you can never find what you want when, when you want to find it. But um, they said in their application that it was like 98.5% alcohol. A and I mean, <laughs> okay, we're all kind of giggling. Sound a little odd to you, Cheryl, for yeah, some reason? We're all kind of giggling here at this table because that, that doesn't, 
in a lounge, I, I guess maybe you could serve that much alcohol. But if we're talking about their banquet facilities too, um, that doesn't hardly yeah, make sense. Food at the bar, right? I yeah. be, well, exactly. Yeah. And um, it, the stipulation that they reached in their settlement said they only had to count beverages. And so I'm assuming that they must serve like one and a half percent soft drinks and 98 and a half percent alcohol because it looked like what they excluded was all meals, mm -hmm. anything food wise. Okay. Well, City Attorney Warren Kraft, of course, did not represent the city in, in this lawsuit uh, with, with the Hilton Garden Inn. Um, and, and the reason that he didn't is because he helped draft, you know, some of the uh, documents and so forth, and he could have been called as, as a witness in the case. Mm -hmm. um, so they got a private a attorney, a separate counsel to, to handle this. Um, but I, I believe Kraft still made the argument that anyone from your group could have attended the court proceedings. And I, I guess basically what he's saying is that it's not incumbent upon anyone in the city to let your group know that, that this happened. Was, was that one of your arguments or were you primarily upset that the exemption was granted? Could I just clarify, did you sure. say that Mr. Kraft said we could have attended? I, I think that that's- He says in the memorandum, why didn't your group seek intervention as an interested party on this issue. Which we had done on the previous lawsuit. Um, but no, we were not given that option. That we, uh, My understanding was that it wasn't even really a lawsuit, it was citations. Okay. They chose not to pay and they went right to a um, declaratory injunction or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer and I can't remember yeah. all those big words, but. It, it's in his March 30th, after you people appeared in the council meetings, mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. asked to prepare this. So it's in here uh, that he says that. Well, I think Margie's right. Um, we thought this was going to be a, a fairly simple settling of citations. Right. And why should citizens intervene, right. attempt to intervene? The first time when we did intervene, uh, it was a serious thing. Our ordinance was about to collapse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we, we felt we had no choice but to intervene. That, that action cost citizens thousands of dollars. And we just don't have the money to do that again. Right. And, but we thought it wasn't necessary. We thought... For this. Yeah. For this, yeah. that settling citations, which were very obviously applicable, and citations were right, oh. <laughs> we, we feel. And I think the city felt at the time that they were too. We don't understand how this outcome came out. Now at the council meeting, item. you were also upset about the, this long delay and not knowing about it. Can you just walk us through that real quick? You guys were really oh, articulate. Sure at the meeting. Uh, I can touch on yeah, that a little bit, Dan. Yeah. Um, we had initially known about the citations, which were issued in August of 05. Um, and I had kind of followed them online. You can go to CCAP and look stuff up, so I did. And I kept um, in touch with the city attorney's office, not the city attorney himself, but his assistant. I also kept in touch with the health department to see what was happening with these citations. and found out that basically the health department decided, yes, they were still smoking, but it was just too much trouble to issue a citation every day. Mm -hmm. So four would be enough. They'd let it go and see what happened. Um, the Hilton had under um, their corporate name, had filed a suit, um, I wanna say probably September. It was fairly quickly after uh -huh. these citations. And at that point, they convinced the city that it would be wiser to take all these citations and um, what's the word not you know just wipe them off so that they could have one suit and the plaintiff would the filed would be the the Beachwood Plaza the Hilton Inn and then they would um, at at that point they would ask for an actual ruling that would apply to any citations issued in the city and that made sense and I believe was actually recommended by a judge because Otherwise, every time a citation was issued, they could take it to court, and if they got different judges, they may get different responses all the time. Um, so then we, um, Kathy and I were, as citizens really, mm -hmm. were just um, monitoring that to see where that went. We attempted to go two or three times to court. Um, by the second or third time, we were getting wiser and calling ahead to see if they actually still had it scheduled. Mm -hmm. um, the last time we attempted that, it you had called at like 8.30 in the morning. It was still on, on the docket. It was scheduled for 10. We got there, you know, 9.30, <laughs> ready to go in. 
and it's not on the list anywhere. Well, they had decided somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30 or whatever to pull it, and that's when they started um, this summary judgment thing that they ended up with. So it's not that we weren't aware and that we weren't attempting to monitor this and see what happened and staying in touch with, with City Hall, but we're not lawyers. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, it never occurred to me at any point that we should be intervening. We're talking a couple of citations, you know. Mm -hmm. They should have paid about $1,000 for the total of all these citations. Mm -hmm. And instead, they choose to turn it into a lawsuit, so. And, and you know, how, how do both of you uh, feel about the fact that the health director, Paul Spiegel, um, nor the special counsel that was asked to handle this, um, they didn't inform our city manager, they didn't inform the city council, they didn't really tell anybody that this had been settled. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, as you may have noticed when we spoke at the council meeting, we were a little shocked. Um, mm -hmm. I, I figured that the council members didn't know. I did not, I, I was as surprised as everybody else when Mr. Wolink didn't know anything about it. And frankly, I don't believe that Mr. Kraft didn't know anything about it because his office had sent me stuff and I just can't believe that he didn't really know about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That might have been a little bit of, oh, I hadn't seen this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I read Mr. Kraft's memo to the council, which was requested after the meeting, and I just want to read a couple of sentences. He says the end result, the decision, maintained the integrity of the smoking ordinance despite its flaws which my office attempted to address at its inception and ensured its continued enforceability rather than have a court overturn the entire ordinance. So from Mr. Kraft's standpoint, this was a decision that rescued or saved a poorly written anti-smoking thing. What's your response to that? Well, um, he has always maintained mm -hmm. that the ordinance was poorly written. Um, however, the ordinance was the result of the council debate the night that we attempted to have the council pass that ordinance, and it did fail mm -hmm. three to four. Mm -hmm. But but the ordinance was essentially that which would have come out of the council meeting that night had we had the fourth positive vote, with the exception of, as Margie pointed out, the uh, hardship exemption. We added in, naively, um, added in a hardship exemption which was not in that ordinance that mm -hmm. the council considered that night in August of 2000. For a certain establishment, you uh, mean? For a restaurant that could prove, could show that they had lost 15% sure. of business, something like that. And so we thought many ordinances had that kind of mm -hmm. hardship provision in it, and we thought if there, there might be business loss, we didn't think there was going to be, but if there were to be, then here's, here's something that would help. Uh, we thought it would help pass the ordinance to have this, to help citizens pass the ordinance. Um, but I do need to point out that uh, Mr. Kraft made the statement in this memo that he attempted to improve right. upon the ordinance. Um, after the council voted no on the ordinance, Mr. Kraft did agree to meet with us, a couple of Breathe 3 representatives, to dot the I's and cross the T's on the ordinance so that were it to pass, it would be in the proper form. He, at that time, specifically told us he could not advise us on um, enforceability or anything. Mm -hmm. He could not advise us on content of the ordinance because he was, from then on, representing the city, and we were private parties mm -hmm. at that point. So the short answer is no, he did not help to improve the ordinance. He also blames May Mark Harris, who was then mayor, for writing the bad draft in the first place. Oh, we've had discuss. We've we've heard <laughs> pros and cons on that, and we yeah, have no I mean, idea. As yeah. individuals, we have no idea what happened. We weren't part of okay. that. Okay, so. okay. I mean, that's enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I thought those were interesting comments. Yeah, the end, and that's what I asked you. We did too. Yeah, you said naively added in a hardship exemption. What what do you why do you call it naively? Uh, in the end, I'm sorry that we added it in. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, some restaurants chose to take advantage of the hardship exemption mm -hmm. and quite frankly I'm not sure that they all qualified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the health department has, shall we say, entertained lukewarm enforcement of the ordinance 
and we've including not including applications for including mm -hmm. applications. Uh, numbers have, have been mm -hmm. suspect; they've not been questioned because we've obtained copies of all the applications mm -hmm. for taverns as well taverns as for exemptions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we have serious questions. See, you know, the sad part of this is is y you end up with, as, as you guys feel, people taking advantage of the situation. You know, in Nina, they have a hardship exemption in their ordinance. And um, to the best of my knowledge, there's there's been one, possibly two, that have actually proven their case. And everybody else has just sort of gone along with it mm. and, you know, like it or not. It's, it's been in place for a number of years, and it doesn't seem to be creating all this big havoc. And, and they certainly didn't have restaurants up there taking advantage of the situation. Um, not like you all seem to be seeing down here. Why is that, do you think? I mean, why, why does it seem to be so difficult to get cooperation in this city? That I can't answer. Mm -hmm. But I do know that in Nina, they, they do tend to have a health department that is backing the ordinance, mm -hmm. which is helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that actually, and in our case, it seems to me personally, I'm just speaking for me, mm -hmm. that our city attorney has chosen to interpret a large portion of the ordinance in a way that our attorney did not interpret it. Um, our, our attorney has said this is totally enforceable. Um, there's no problem with the way it was written. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Kraft has said, well, you know, we don't know about this, so uh, Mr. Spiegel, you don't have to do this or that. Mm -hmm. And that's been a big problem for me, personally. Was the Nina ordinance passed by the council uh, rather than by referendum? I'm trying to think now. Um, I, our I, floor director is shaking her <laughs> head yes. Yeah, see, I think she lives up there. I think that's one of the differences I was talking mm -hmm. to you before. I think if you refer your own measure and circumvent the powers that be, uh, and put it directly on the ballot. <laughs> they, they, they're not really overly excited about the accomplishment of your referendum. Well, and the Nina ordinance yeah. was weak. Yeah. The Nina ordinance was weak. Uh, there was smoking allowed in uh, a bar area, area. Yeah. Okay. not in an enclosed room. Our ordinance, the Oshkosh ordinance, was stronger. It was one of the strongest okay. in the state at that time, okay. where yeah, you had to have a separate enclosed room in order to have smoking. You know, an open bar area, as in many establishments in our community, uh, you, smoking was not permitted. And then we hi had a higher alcohol uh, exemption, 70% okay. alcohol for a tavern. And if memory serves me correctly to answer your question, I believe that it was, it was put on a ballot and I believe it was an advisory referendum in Nina, and then the, and then the council acted okay. on it. I, I, if I recall correctly, that's how that went down. I'm just saying, if you do it the regular way, it's smart. If yeah. you do it the irregular way, then. Yeah. What about the future? Uh, do you think this ordinance should be amended to make it stronger? To, to, I mean, is that well, something? Well, we think the future is the statewide smoke-free workplace ban okay. that is being proposed now. Carol Ressler, I believe, is sponsoring that legislation. Okay. The governor has indicated he would like to sign something like this. Okay. And but that's to not me bar and restaurants. Yes, it oh, is. Yes, it is. That's everything. Oh, that's everything. everything. Oh, okay. All Every indoor workplace. workplaces would be smoke-free. Okay. As of Monday, I could not find a bill that's been introduced on that yet. Oh, Maybe I have a copy you really? for you. <laughs> okay. And so we think that's the answer. Yeah. It's the answer for um, a lot of city problems, too. Yeah, it's, a, it's, an it's yeah. the answer for a lot of city problems yeah. that Thank you're you. very young. Oh, uh, very the nice. Oshkosh example, to me, demonstrates the need for a strong statewide ban that is uniform across the state uh -huh. so that all establishments will have a level playing field. They've mm -hmm. asked for this. They've mm -hmm. begged for it. You know restaurants felt the taverns next door got their business mm -hmm. because they could smoke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that in some cases that was true sure. and and then that would also a strong ban would protect those cities that had the courage to go to 100 percent smoke-free mm -hmm. environments like Madison and Appleton mm -hmm. where the restaurants did fight it mm -hmm. tooth and nail and went back three times I want to talk about this uh, in in a minute or two but I, I want to go back if we can to the, the situation with the Hilton Garden Inn. You know, one of the things that city manager Dick Wallink um, referenced was that he 
he apparently he didn't seem to feel too concerned that he wasn't notified about this out of court settlement. Um, he sort of compared it to traffic site, ticket. yeah, what, traffic yeah. citations, yeah. tickets, what have you. Uh, that he's not notified about those. Um, and you know, do we want our city manager bogged down with every little traffic citation? Of course not. But no. but I mean, that really is a ridiculous comparison when when you think about it. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you ladies would agree because <laughs> this this was one of the most divisive contentious issues that this city has faced and I can't tell you how long mm -hmm. and to to not especially when we're paying a, a different attorney above and beyond our city attorney and right. his staff we're paying special counsel to handle this and then city staff city administrations not told about it I think that's deplorable and uh, you know, Kathy, as as someone who used to serve on the city <laughs> council, she's getting <laughs> <good. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, just uh, you you served on the city council for for some time. Um, you know, how do you, as a former council person, feel about something like that happening? Uh, I'm sorry it happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a city council member, I would want the city manager to know. Mm -hmm. I would want him to follow it and ask periodic, periodically about mm -hmm. updates. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wallink was in fact the person who got the ball rolling after we complained about the Hilton Garden Inn private club situation in uh, June 2005. We met with Mr. Wallink, mm -hmm. some of us, and said this is ridiculous. We have got to stop this. And at that point he had just attended a wedding at the Hilton Garden Inn and realized what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that the so-called private club thing was really not private mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And so he got upset and I think asked the health department to enforce it. Mm -hmm. well, and so then for him not to follow up on the outcome of this lawsuit, I don't understand. I don't know what happened. Yeah, well, um, it does seem rather odd. Uh, you know, we're about to seat a, a new city council here um, in, a, in a week or two um, from the time that this show airs. And, you know, I mean, do you think that maybe this is an issue that needs to be addressed with the city council that on, on matters like this, people are apprised of what has gone on? If I was a council person, I would certainly be wanting to bring that up. Yeah. Would you want another enforcement person in the ordinance, I mean, rather than the person that's assigned now? Would that strengthen your... Our attorney has said that although it says the health department is uh -huh. the enforcing party in here, that does not prevent them from passing that um, enforcement power on to the police department, right. for example. They don't have to wait and have the health right. department issue a citation. Um, the police department could. Okay, could. They, our attorney feels they sh they can yeah. under the ordinance. Um, Maybe should would be. Should might be a very good word for yeah. that. Yes, yes, given the time that city halls open yeah. and the time people tend to smoke, yeah. Yeah. Um, in public. <laughs> 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 um, however, uh, Mr. Kraft has taken a different interpretation of the same wording and has has apparently told the health department they have to be the one to issue mm -hmm. the citations. But the, there also seems to be some confusion uh, I I amongst business owners and, and probably the public as well between this, the difference between a private function and a private club. Can, can you ladies kind of address that as far as your interpretation of the ordinance? Well, uh, the ordinance does say that the term restaurant shall not include entire rooms or halls while being used for private functions. And we envisioned that as being one of the ballrooms out at the Hilton Garden Inn. Mm -hmm. Someone wanted to have a private function, a wedding reception, they wanted to allow smoking. Uh, we envisioned that that could happen, smoking could happen within that room for that one private function. Mm -hmm. And then the next time, someone rented the hall, likely it would be smoke free. And so that was that one time, one thing, within an enclosed room. Um, it is being interpreted by the city health department and perhaps the city attorney's office to include areas within restaurants that are not closed off rooms. Mm -hmm. And certainly not 
separately ventilated smoking rooms, which the ordinance very clearly spells out, uh, should, should be, such as I think the Roxy has built, mm -hmm. a separately ventilated mm -hmm. right. smoking exactly. room, which I'm sure I yeah. would imagine, and Fratello's had one right. to begin with, right. which meet the standards right. of the ordinance, and that's the type of thing where smoke, it's type of place where smoking should occur. Right. Right. And, well, there, and the reason that I ask that is because, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, City Manager Wolink had attended this wedding at the Hilton Garden Inn and realized that there was kind of a problem there. Um, there were some election night parties just the other night at, at Kodiak Jack's where a, a picture in the newspaper uh, actually showed where smoking was being allowed <laughs> in, in this party area. But, I mean, I was... Was that an enclosed area? I don't know. I, I wasn't invited to those parties. <laughs> um, I was because I would be, my personal opinion is yeah. if that were not an enclosed area, I consider that, and I'm not an attorney, I consider that a violation of our ordinance. Um, and if it wasn't posted that you had to be mm -hmm. invited to attend, that it was an invitation-only place, then it should still have been open to the public, so you shouldn't be smoking mm -hmm. there. I don't think at that place it could be enclosed from... Yeah. It's my so understanding no, that it can't no, be no. and that it's not separately ventilated. No, no, so and I so I, but again, why should citizens have to find out about right, something exactly. like this and then go out and observe? One would have to physically <laughs> be there to observe, you know, make right. the phone call ourselves, you right. know, or call, call the police department. We shouldn't have to do of course that. Not. But you're paying the price because you went around them. <laughs> well, and I've been told uh, by the health department that if I do call them, and if somebody calls me and says, I just came from Kodiak Jacks, uh -huh. they're smoking there, and I in turn call because this citizen didn't want to be involved, they will not take anything I say and act on it anymore. Uh -huh. Because, you know, I'm just that wild card or something, I don't know. Uh -huh. that, so it, it has to be the exact person that sees it uh -huh. at the time they see it. The catch is the health department's not open then, right. you know. So you it could deputize Daniel Lynch to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, um, the appropriate process is for a citizen who observes right. something that they believe is a violation of the ordinance to call the police department. Mm -hmm. And the police department, when they have time, <laughs> um, goes to that spot and observes what's happening, reports that to the health department, and then I think that's how the citations get mm -hmm. issued. So there is an enforcement mechanism indirectly. Yeah. Maybe I could be deputized or something. Well, so there, we could do that. there we go. There we go. You know, it, and yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it is fine that they don't want to take someone who hasn't seen the offense, they don't want to take their word for it, if you will, because mm -hmm. that's kind of like a hearsay sort of thing. But, you know, what is a citizen to do if the health department's not mm -hmm. open and, and the police can't respond in a timely fashion? And, you know, we've had kind of a rash of some pretty serious crimes here lately. And, you know, they can't mm -hmm. always get to handle a smoking violation or something like that. But it just, do, does it seem to you that maybe there's just a, 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 a certain amount of laziness coming from the health department? Would, would, or, or is that kind of a rash characterization? Why well, are they so reluctant I'd, to I don't to want do to something? characterize anybody in City Hall as lazy. Um, Disinterested might be appropriate. I think I feel that City Hall has never been in favor of this ordinance. From the very beginning, um, I had conversations, private conversations, which led me to believe that key, key officials did not want this ordinance, were not interested in this ordinance. They thought that smoking, that it was up to the uh, citizen not to frequent the restaurant where there was smoking. It was a business right. And that smoke, when businesses chose not to have smoking, it should be a voluntary thing and not something forced on them by the city council or by citizens. Um, this attitude has persisted. It's an old attitude. Yeah. And I think it's reflected in the uh, Informal enforcement. What, what's another word, Margie? Uh, <laughs> um, lack of enforcement? Is that lack what you're searching for? Lack of enforcement. For? <laughs> maybe that's it. Uh, if I can interject. Unenthusiastic. I think ahead. the time that that really um, came home to me 
was after um, there were about 20 restaurants that filed a lawsuit shortly after the ordinance went into effect, as you know. It went into effect in April, and it, that happened in July. And uh, the judge at that time um, issued a 10-month injunction, as mm -hmm. you referred to, Cheryl. She also said that we had to mediate. Um, that would be the Breathe Free people who believe that public health should be more important, and that would be the 20 restaurants. And when that mediation occurred, the city was also present. Um, it was a retired judge that they hired as a mediator, and we all met in the same location, and um, the restaurant stayed in the conference room, and we went to a different conference room. They got the one with the coffee, but that was okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had water. <laughs> um, and we met for four hours, long time. The judge went back and forth between the rooms. And at the very last time when he came in, because he'd come in and say, okay, they're willing to do this. And we'd say, well, you know, that doesn't work for us. Would they be willing to do this? You know, typical mediation type stuff. Well, the last time he came in, I said, excuse me, but where is the city? Are you, what's their opinion on this? There's three entities here. We interceded as the defendant, okay? The city was the defendant also and the restaurant um, group was the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who brought the suit. The city and the restaurants were together, the judge told us. The, the actual plaintiff and defendant were together discussing this while the intervening defendants were in another room. I was so surprised. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just had not, e that had never even occurred to me. Um, but I think that spoke very closely to where the city stands on this issue. And it was very disappointing. Still is. Mm -hmm. Well, so what is your next step on a city level? I still say the next step is to go to the state level. Um, that we've shown here that smoking ordinances really don't work well if there are exemptions and loopholes. Mm -hmm. And for to uh, support public health and to provide a level playing field for businesses, I really think we've got to have a statewide ban. Without reading the bill, who enforces this if it becomes statewide? Do you know? I just read that an hour ago. I don't mean to trick you, but already. I mean, I just, I mean, okay. There is strong enforcement strong language in, in there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because I think that's yes. very important. Yes. Yeah. I, I was curious if um, our city would tend to enforce something more strongly if it was a state law, and oh. I would certainly hope so. I would hope so. Yeah. You know, there's, um, there's, in Wisconsin right now, there's 23 different cities that are smoke free. Right. Three of those are 100%. Um, that would be Appleton and Madison and Shorewood Hills. And it's just phenomenal, phenomenal to me that there can be that many cities in Wisconsin, that there's 18 states in the union that are 100% smoke-free, um, including, I'm proud to say, Colorado went mm -hmm. there shortly, uh, not long ago, because that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, there's all these countries that have done it. I mean, entire countries. France is going smoke-free in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been to France, you know, all they do there is smoke, you know. Ireland, Norway. Exactly. Yes. If they can be smoke-free, why can't Wisconsin? Um, I, I really think the time has come. When we had our ordinance, we were kind of a, a little, we were really pushing the envelope mm -hmm. to have as strong of an ordinance as we had at that time. We had one of the strongest ones, like Kathy mm -hmm. said. Um, that was three years ago. It's time now to go to the next step and, like Kathy said, lay a, level the playing field, but also provide that public health for everybody. Um, I know there'd been one restaurant in Oshkosh that had um, tested the waters before the ordinance passed, going smoke-free on certain nights. The problem with that is that there's so many carcinogens and it, it attaches to the draperies and the carpeting and the tablecloths and it's still not a safe environment for public health. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to people who have any kind of respiratory problems for health, um, for, for heart um, disease, kids with asthma, ki it, They've even discovered that secondhand smoke contributes to earaches that the kids have, the ear infections. There's all these things, and the, um, oh, you know, who's that top guy, the health guy for the surgeon country? Surgeon General. Thank you, surgeon yeah, General. that guy. <laughs> the top guy. <laughs> yeah, the top guy. Um, when the Surgeon General last July right. came out with a list of all these warnings, how can we ignore that? It's not like, okay, you know, these, these people are crazy and they don't want smoke blowing in their face. 
I just like to live a little longer, you know? I don't mm -hmm. want the smoke in my lungs. <laughs> so, right. Well, I I as you both know, um, I was not in favor of this when it came forward um, because I felt that each business should be allowed to do what they wanted to do. Um, and but it, and it, and it, I don't think it did really create any kind of a level playing field. I think it really caused some problems for some restaurants. But I, I also, you know, enjoy now walking into a restaurant and not smelling that smoke. And, you know, the people who say, well, then don't go to those establishments. And I was one of them. But then when you really sit and think about it, okay, well, if you don't go here and you don't go there and nobody is smoke free, basically you're not you know, frequenting any establishment, essentially, mm -hmm. and everybody has the right to go there. And, you know, the problem with some of these places that um, misinterpret or misunderstand the private club versus private function thing in the ordinance, you know, um, that, that seems to create some problems, too, because then you've got places like the Roxy that spend a lot of money to do mm -hmm. things the right way and to comply with the ordinance. And, you know, if a statewide thing passes, that may all be for naught now. But let's talk about things on a, on a state level. Um, the Wisconsin Restaurant Association is, is uh, fully in support of this with no exemptions. Mm -hmm. um, but Governor Doyle has said that he will entertain exemptions for bars and taverns. Um, I'm assuming you both feel that that is wrong, that he should not do that? I would feel that was wrong, but it was my understanding that he had changed that um, along about March 20th. It's fairly recent. He may have. Yeah. He may have. Yes, I received yeah. a letter because I had uh, written a letter, of course, right away <laughs> to my legislators and to <laughs> Governor Doyle, and I received a letter from his office indicating that he was still in favor of the strong ban without exceptions. Probably, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As are we. Yeah. So I'm yeah. hoping that that's the case. I'm, I, I know early on there was some waffling. <laughs> right, and and that's what I was referring yeah, he, to. I, mm -hmm. I he was uh, he was not clear, and I mean he, he said he wasn't sure that he'd go with yeah, bars. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I to me there's no point in no, having a statewide ban if it isn't a strong one. No, mm -hmm. and you can't exclude bars. No, no, no. I mean bowling alleys everywhere because it needs to be bar, smoke then? free. That's any right. any indoor yeah. environment, which is a workplace. Uh, yeah. Kind of a, a corollary is he uh, Governor Doyle's proposed increasing cigarette tax by a dollar twenty five per pack. Mm -hmm. Assume we support that. And then part of the money goes to the Health Quality Fund. Do you know what that is? I have received emails on that. Um, I'm not sure that I can speak to it okay. very directly because I, I read them and, you know, they kind of go in one ear and out sure. the other. Um, but it sounds but like I part of the money is being designated to yes. something that looks good at well, least. Well, a lot of the money would be going to Medicaid. Okay. Um, but, yes, he set up a special fund, and I believe that's what that's referring okay. to, okay. where it would actually help... Um, keep youth from being interested in smoking. That's the biggest advantage to, the, to upping the cigarette tax, is that it does dissuade youth from starting to smoke because they just can't afford it and maybe get them to quit. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest problem we have. And of course, the, the big tobacco companies, they're losing customers left and right, mostly, you know, because they're dying off from emphysema and lung cancer mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but a lot of people are choosing not to smoke now, too. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying so hard to get the, the teenagers and scary but even before they're teenagers they're after those kids and so hopefully an extra buck mm -hmm. and a quarter a pack mm -hmm. would would really influence that that's what we were supposed to use the uh, settlement with the tobacco companies was for preventive but it <laughs> we don't even want to go it there went Dan. to balance the budget <laughs> <for> <laughs> one, one <biennium. laughs> that's another one hour show <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's over <laughs> um, do either of you have any sense of, uh, and I have not seen that bill, Dan, mm -hmm. you just got it. I don't mm -hmm. have a copy of it yet. We'll have to get that. But um, do either of you have any sense of, of a timeline on this, um, what we're looking at? Yeah, Short just answer just is no. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they were still looking for co-sponsors so as late good. as yeah. two weeks ago. Really mm -hmm. doesn't have yeah. sponsors on the top of the page. They, yeah. they had had... Um, three senators and four legislators, if I recall correctly, initially sponsoring, but they were actively recruiting um, at the state level to get that. Um, Smoke Free Wisconsin has been doing a lot of direct lobbying to get co-sponsors, um, to get more people involved in that. And as they have been working in the Capitol for several years, Smoke Free Wisconsin has, of course. Yeah. Ironically, Smoke Free Wisconsin's budget is about a hundredth of what Big Tobacco spends on lobbying. 
mm -hmm. and in our state. So it's not exactly in balance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, with with the uh, Wisconsin Restaurant Association, you know, supporting a, a statewide ban like that, have you been in contact with any local restaurant owners to uh, know how they feel about this? Are they willing to work with you and uh, state uh, smoke-free Wisconsin on a statewide basis? Quite frankly, I think my going to talk to some local restaurant owners would be about as welcome as a skunk at a picnic. <laughs> 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 so I, I'm intimidated, I don't feel welcome by going to talk to them about this issue. Um, if they want to approach us, you know, I'd be more than happy mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I sense that the restaurant association, restaurants are the ones that, that have been heard if anybody has with these kinds of, of uh, local bands because mm -hmm. smokers go next door to the tavern. And so I think restaurants see this as a way to, uh, <laughs> they see it coming. Mm -hmm. Public health is demand being demanded and they might as well get on board. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of them. Would I'm the Common Council endorse this bill? that be a resolution? Do they do that sort of thing? <laughs> I think they tend not to. Yeah, I, I, that's what I thought. And I, I, they yeah. try to stay out of things yeah, like that. Yeah. But, this, but is, this is local. Yeah, well, and it this is, a way, yeah. This is yeah. a way to say, you know, our local situation, we've had severe problems with. Yeah, exactly. And here's an answer. Yep. What, um, we, we talked a little bit about kids and, and smoking, um, and you had mentioned Dan Lynch, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, who I think most people know from going to the council meetings and, and giving regular reports and so forth. And, you know, I, I, I drive by the high school uh, on a regular basis, both high schools, and, and I see kids smoking all the time. And I understand our police department is very hard working and, and you know, they've only got so many hours in a day to, to handle certain things. But is there any kind of, um, have you heard anything from the police department about why they're not enforcing this more when they see kids smoking? I've never had any discussion with anybody except Dan on that, and I've heard the same things you do, of course. Mm -hmm. As you can well imagine, he was a very big supporter of our ordinance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but no, and I work in a school. Um, the kids there are a little younger. That it's not a high school. Um, but it's not an issue in the school district either, as far as I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, not a big issue, I should say. But again, I'm not in a high school. Maybe they are a little bit more proactive there. Um, having said that, however, I do belong to the Winnebago County Coalition, uh, Tobacco-Free Coalition, and there is a member of um, the school, a, a school administrator that does come as a representative for the Oshkosh Area School District. So they have some level of awareness and have had some grants and have had, um, you know, some, some action. As long as kids are still smoking, it obviously hasn't been enough. Mm -hmm. I believe they also touch on it in the D.A.R.E. program. Mm -hmm. which is still okay. in place in the fifth grade. Yeah, yeah. But. yeah, they were talking about doing away with D.A.R.E. or something at, at one point, I mm -hmm. think, weren't they, because of funding, funding and, yeah. early and budget so forth? Suggestion, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I still think that, you know, the time you people uh, really were well received at the last council meeting and it seemed to be the time is ripe <laughs> for, and like Cheryl asked earlier, you know, what, what are your plans? It seems to me that with a new council that you know, uh, this is uh, this probably isn't going to happen overnight. Um, hopefully, but you know, this is this It'll is a, take a little while. This is a big process. obstacle. I mean, there, this yeah. is this is statewide opposition as well as statewide support. That you might go to the council and and you know maybe a couple areas you might look at and and get a council member to to amend it. I mean, uh, th you know, there are some confusion in, in certain things in here. Not taking Warren Craft's side, but and, and the enforcement person. Maybe you should look at that. Just, just suggestion. Mm -hmm. But th I think this would be a really a propitious time for you people to say, you know, this enforcement procedure just isn't working. This is what the citizens of Oshkosh passed, and we need to we need to we need to perfect it or strengthen it a little bit. I think you'd get a good reception with the new council. You, you may have noticed that at the council meeting when we spoke, we were received better by the councilors than we were the city staff. Well, of course, you did pick up on that, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. But that, yeah. but they are the. <laughs> the decision makers, at least in theory. In theory, yes, they should <laughs> yeah. be. 
Yeah. And and they ultimately hire and or fire the city manager Absolutely. who oversees the department heads, including right. you know the yeah. the public health. Yeah, all these candidates came to us and said they wanted accountability, didn't they, Sean? Yes, they did. Huh? They did. <laughs> that was the key word of and of this past. So campaign. maybe it's time so. to get some accountability. Yeah. Well, and I think there's there's no question that the ordinance has some problems. Yeah. You know, it is not a perfect ordinance. It's not 100%, so I can't No, it's not 100%, no, it's not 100% <laughs> yeah. but also, you know, for being a partial right. ban, it's not perfect. Yeah. And I wish, I wish that there were ways we could neatly clean it up without starting, yeah. without reopening the wounds. Yeah, I understand. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, between restaurant and bars and Breathe Free and uh, when, one, uh, when one opens up the ordinance for amendment, one doesn't know what's going to happen. You could lose it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And if it comes to that point where the statewide ban is not passed, mm -hmm. perhaps that's something that, yeah. that we, we could ask a counselor yeah. to, to look at. But um, Well, you don't go to the council unless you have four votes. I mean, that's, yeah. You try not to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she think you have four votes for sure, yeah. yeah. It is... Um, uh, we, we are very hopeful that the sure. statewide ban will go into effect. Obviously, it would take some time to work through our council, and, you know, even if we go and say, accountability, do it, you know. Right. So we are hoping that the statewide ban will take care of that yeah. um, in a timely fashion. So I would assume the enforcement of the state law without reading it, it would be the district attorney. It wouldn't be, because it's a state law, it would be operated so you'd have a, a better chance of dealing with a different layer of government. You know what I mean? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I'm not either, but I, you know, usually and state bills are enforced by county district attorneys, not by... I know you. I saw that in there. Yeah. It's towards the front. I'll look for that while okay. you guys chat. Yeah. But, but there again, I'm not sure how, how that would work either because, you know, the district attorney's budget, um, his office's budget is, is tight as well. Yes. And I, I don't know how you'd get someone from his office to really enforce it all that well either. I, th I think it probably still would have to start yeah. with yeah. the local police department. But the difference is he is an elective officer, unlike yes. the health person or the city yes. attorney. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> That's <know>? true. <laughs> um, it's in an, an appendix to this bill, so we don't actually oh, have okay. that information. Right. It does say that this bill requires people, the persons in charge of places where smoking is prohibited, enforce the, the ban itself. And I mean by the local asking, owners, you mean? Right. Okay. By either asking them to okay. um, quit smoking or leave. Yeah. Again, that would depend on if they felt like doing that, That's I suppose. Right. Yeah. Where, um, because Dan and I had not seen that prior to tonight, Margie, where can someone find a copy of that bill? Um, you can go to the state website and if, actually, Cheryl, if you want to copy down this number that's yeah. right up here, you can just put that number into the state website. Yeah, There's a place where it says, you know, what, what are you looking up? Okay. And um, I didn't read it through in time, obviously, to realize there was an appendix or I would have would have had that too. See, and that's why that legislative research person couldn't help me because there is not a bill number There's assigned to this yet. There's not a number to it yet it's, it's, because it's really it hasn't been introduced. Yeah, it's yes. early, you know. You could also at any time go to smokefreewisconsin.org and they have links to a number of different um, resources. And there's also um, tobaccowis.org, which is T-O-B-W-I-S.org, I believe. And that also has a wealth of information. So okay. maybe that'll be helpful. Well, we'll, uh, we'll try and get some information on, on the website about this. Um, I, I, Kathy, I know you said that <laughs> The restaurants aren't real receptive to you folks, are you? Or I don't feel welcome, okay. let's put it that way. Okay, <laughs> um, and, and that's fair. She that's, said a that's, skunk that's, in a picnic, that's, that's pretty... That's pretty dramatic, yeah, that I is. that message. Um, but have, have you guys done any kind of research or, or talked with anyone to really find out how this ordinance has affected the restaurants mm. in Oshkosh from a financial standpoint? I mean, other than what we've seen with some of them who have applied for exemptions? I think any information that we would have available would be anecdotal. Mm -hmm. um, in places where they actually do research this, they go by tax information when it comes in. Mm -hmm. And of course, we don't have, as private citizens, we don't really have access mm -hmm. to that. I can tell you that 
in every single state and every single city where they have researched that across the entire country, they've found that if it affects the hospitality industry at all when they go smoke free in an area, it's that it helps it. New York City is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. They didn't have restaurants closing, they had restaurants opening. They ended up with more restaurants after they went 100% smoke free in New York City, mm -hmm. not the state. Um, there's a gentleman in California that's been researching this for 30 years. And um, that website, I don't know offhand, but I will get it to you, Cheryl. Okay. And he had spoken in Appleton um, a couple years ago. Just phenomenal, the amount of information that is available. I have a binder at home that I didn't bring, frankly, because it's too heavy to carry, but I had taken it to mediation with us to show the judge. This is all information about how dangerous cigarette smoking is, secondhand smoke. Mm -hmm. And there's an 18-page bibliography in there, just places to go and look for stuff. And all the research shows that secondhand smoke and smoking yourself is not healthy, um, duh. And it just amazes me that people can argue with that. You know, that's, th or they say, oh, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. That's a choice. They're choosing not to believe it because they want to mm -hmm. not feel guilty, you know. Well, of course, you know, everybody, I mean, you can, you can take data and you can skew it any yes. way <laughs> to, to fit any argument. Um, and, and I'm sure that that's where some of it's coming from. They're going to say, well, you know, I can skew this this way to prove my point that we don't need something like this or, or that businesses are going to fail. Why um, isn't there any yeah. of that on the other side of this issue, though? Yeah. You won't find anything except anecdotal evidence, and it yeah. would be maybe mm -hmm. locally. Um, I have been in touch with one of the restaurant owners. It's, um, in fact, they had contacted me before the Wisconsin Restaurant Association came out publicly, mm -hmm. you know, and let me know about this. Um, which was marvelous because I'd been worried, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now if we could just get that Tavern League on board. <laughs> but, uh, and they perpetually have told me that it's only been good for business. Um, I, I don't believe that it could be any different. If 75% of the people don't smoke, how can going smoke free hurt your business? Mm -hmm. It could only help, right? Seems to me. Well, I, I mean, you would think so, and of course, I've looked at this from both sides because I've kind of been on both sides of the fence. But you know, when when you look at it, sometimes longer and and harder, and with different eyes, y you do, and, and with an open mind, of course, you you tend to see things somewhat differently. Um, and and I guess that's where I have kind of come come to uh, be at the point where I'm at right now. Um, I was just thinking of something, and I it, mm -hmm. it has. It Just came. <laughs> it le oh, I know what it was. You were talking about New York and and how they have just had tremendous success out there. Mm -hmm. What what would either of you attribute that success to? Uh, again, is it having a, a city administration or a statewide organization um, within your state government that is on board with something like this and is supportive of it, or what is it? Maybe New Yorkers like to breathe smoke-free air. <laughs> I haven't done any studies on that. I don't have any idea. I've never even been to New York. <laughs> well, I haven't either, but... <laughs> I have, but I can't answer your question. I, 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 I think know. part of it is when, when one does go to a state where there's a smoke-free environment, it's, it's wonderful. It's freeing. Mm -hmm. you, know, we, you can walk in anywhere and mm -hmm. know that you don't have to deal with smoke. Mm -hmm. And here in Wisconsin, you have to think. Can I walk in this place? Is this, a, is this the city that allows smoking, doesn't allow smoking in restaurants? Is this a tavern? You know, what is it? Am I going to be subjected to smoke? Mm -hmm. Do I want to do that? You know, and, mm -hmm. and that you have to make all these decisions mm -hmm. where in a state or a city where everything is smoke free, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and so you go anywhere and do anything and enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> I think that's part mm -hmm. of it. And, and I think I, I just want to point out that the, the restaurant tavern business is a very difficult business and mm -hmm. they have gone through I think locally some economic issues and various restaurants opening and closing that had to do with the industry I don't think it had anything to do with the smoking mm -hmm. ban this was something that was happening within their industry for various competitive reasons mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm sorry that it's a difficult business it is. because we do like to go yeah. out and yeah. and eat all of us like to go out and eat and enjoy it um, but I don't think troubles should be blamed on the smoking ban 
As one restaurant owner pointed out to me when our ban initially went into effect, it was about the same time of year that it got warmer out. And their assumption was that any loss of business was because people were now grilling out instead of going out to eat. It was a different kind of a social atmosphere. How can you argue with that? You know, I don't know if that was correct or not, but they weren't blaming it on the smoking ban. They had a very good attitude about that. They just felt that it was based on other things. The restaurants that did have the problems, I think, were the ones who were greeting their customers at the door with, oh, you're here tonight? Well, you know you can't smoke in here anymore. And people that were going to that place for the first time mm -hmm. were really turned off by that. Maybe they had just driven in from Winnicani to, to go to this restaurant because now we were smoke free and they get a negative response like that. They didn't want to return. Mm -hmm. so. On the oh. state level, do you think the hard sell in this bill is to include bars and taverns? Do you think that's where the, the real fight will come or don't know? Or? Oh, I think that's the Tavern Association is the only major organization that I'm aware of that is Oppose, against the against bill. Against this bill, um, will that be a hard sell? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I hope not because the time has come to protect public health. Mm -hmm. And if they're the only institution, you know, the only organization against it, we have to. Mm -hmm. But they are to powerful. Proceed. They are very powerful, yeah. but. Yes, they are. But I, I'm, Frank, as, as one individual, I'm tired mm -hmm. of lobbying groups making policy. I think citizens need to let their legislators know how they feel, and let's let's have a vote on that basis. Amen. Well, and, and the polls yeah. clearly show. I mean, it doesn't matter where you look at polls. They all seem to be, mm -hmm. you know, 70 to 75 percent of people participating in polls are saying, <clears throat> yeah, this is, this is mm -hmm. a yeah. measure that its time has come. Um, just very quickly, and we're almost out of time, but in not having seen this, um, do you know, d how does it address um, a home-based business? I, I would guess, I looked at it very quickly, but I would guess it leaves a home-based business alone. Even if you have employees in that business? I mean, if, um, if somebody, you know, is just running their own business from their home and, and they're on their own, I, you know, I can see where that wouldn't be an issue at all because after all, it is their home. But if you have an employee or a couple employees, I mean, I don't want to put I you don't on know. the spot. There are exemptions, or not, there <coughs> aren't exemptions. There are lists of places that, to which this does apply. Yeah, and, and I don't see. Centers, but it's not an all-inclusive no, list either. No, yeah, it's no, are included, in the, but not limited to. Okay. <laughs> I, I, Sorry, I we don't know. And thing. again, the fact that this doesn't have a bill number tells you that it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Sure, right. sure. I think one thing, though, that we can't emphasize, emphasize strongly enough is that this isn't about not liking people who smoke or something. This is about public health. Mm -hmm. And it's for when public refers to all of us and health refers, well, you know. Mm -hmm. So the whole issue is strictly public health. And it's extremely important that people do understand that because it is such a big thing. OK. All right. Well, very good. Well, we'll watch this as this, uh, you know, takes form and, and uh, hopefully makes its way through the through the legislature and so forth. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens locally as well. Okay. Thanks to both of you for being yeah, here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure as always. Dan, thanks to you yeah. and, and welcome yeah. aboard on a regular thank you. basis. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And thanks as always to you folks at home. You we'll see you next time. Until then, uh, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got all right on Oshkosh.